Hi, we love vintage computers here on the EEV blog and I've got a Bobby Dazzler for you today. It is one of the biggest flops in personal computer history. It is the IBM PC Junior. Don't call me Junior. Don't call me Junior. <laughs> Some of it in the original shrink wrapped packaging. We've got the original box and everything. Let's check it out. And this personal computer abomination from 1984 is the IBM PC Junior. Of course, after the phenomenal success of the original IBM PC released in 1981, they wanted to get into the home computer market because the original PC was flat out a business machine and priced accordingly. It just... Virtually no one was using it as a home machine. So they wanted to compete against the uh, Apple II, the Commodore 64, which had come out uh, more than a year earlier than this one, actually. This one was announced in late 1983, but didn't come out until March 1984. And it was priced at $669 for 64 kilobytes of RAM or $1,269 for the one we've got here, which is the uh, 128 kilobyte version. But it didn't come with the five and a quarter inch floppy drive which we had here. In fact, it came with no storage, uh, no external uh, tape or disk storage at all. So it might have been reasonably priced at $669 in 1984, but only if it came with a reasonable external storage, which it didn't. So that was one of the killer blows right off the bat. Now, one of the things that this computer is famous or notorious for is the keyboard that came with it. Unfortunately, we don't have it here, but here's a uh, photo of it. It's uh, a chiclet style keyboard, chiclet meaning it's got like the little square keys on it and just a membrane. It wasn't, a, you know, a proper tactile um, uh, keyboard. Uh, it just used these horrible little chiclet membrane keys and IBM just got so hammered for this they had to finally <laughs> release uh, this one which is uh, actually it was quite innovative for the time when not only is it a you know a proper uh, keyboard it's not as good as the original IBM ones but you know it's pretty good it's you know you could still type on it uh, but it was actually wireless and that's what the wireless sensor down here is for and that was actually pretty innovative uh, for the time but you could also uh, connect it via this uh, lead over here so a wireless infrared keyboard but apparently a lot of people had trouble with that so just adding insult to injury on top of the ridiculous chiclet debacle so anyway uh yes this one has uh turned yellow so that would be the uh bromine in the uh, plastics very common for computers in the 80s to turn yellow like this so not only was it $1,269 for the 128 kilobyte version, which you had to get because the video, it didn't have a proper video card in this like the IBM PC had. It actually shared the system memory. Um, so, you know, the 64 kilobytes was not only uh, limited in terms of that, but also the video hardware actually uh, stole CPU cycles for the refresh and everything else. So it was apparently notoriously slow. It does have uh, the same 8088 processor as the original IBM PC, running at 4.77 megahertz. But as I said, it stole, uh, I think, one in every four clock cycles for the video for that. So it actually ran slow and it didn't have direct memory access, DMA in it. Oh! But it wasn't all bad, because one of the interesting things you can see down the front here is that they actually had two cartridge slots. They're just, uh, you know, standard card edge connectors in there you might be able to see. And these two cartridge slots uh, avoided the problem with the uh, shared video memory in this, side, in this thing. And you could actually hot plug the cartridges in the front like this and would actually reboot the computer and boot directly from the ROM cartridge. So that was quite novel, but because it never took off, I don't know what was available for the cartridges. Uh, nothing. Some people think the IBM PC Junior runs only about this much software. So wouldn't they be pleased to know that PC Junior runs over 50 of the most up-to-date word processing programs, over 25 mailing list and 15 database programs, over 60 programs for personal finance and home management. There are 15 programs for communications and another 15 for the stock market, over 200 for general business. 
Over 300 for education. 10 programs to help you write your own programs. And hundreds more to help you do almost anything. Plus powerful new cartridge programs like Lotus 123. The truth is, PC Junior runs over a thousand of the best, most up-to-date programs. And with its new memory expansion attachment, it can run well over a thousand more. PC Junior from IBM. The computer that's growing by leaps and bounds. Now, I actually rather like uh, the design of this. It's small and compact and, it, you know, didn't take up much space. It looked, you know, fairly professional and everything else. It had the uh, side expansion uh, packs, which we'll uh, take a look at at the back. And, and But one of the things is, is that while this was small and compact, look what you needed. Clunk. A big 56 watt <laughs> mains transformer. But if that external power brick wasn't enough, wah, 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 you had to get one of these power expansion attachments. And it just so happens that we have this here. Look at this in its original box. Ta da! And that came with yet another oh, power brick. Check it out, another power brick where you actually plug this into the side of the unit over here and this would uh, provide extra power because the power brick for the main machine wasn't, presumably wasn't enough. Uh, might have been an engineering goof. They might have thought, oh yeah, we've got enough power to power these uh, expansion uh, packs over here which had extra memory and parallel ports and whatnot and then when they tried it they went oh yeah we don't really have the power budget for that I know we can design and this <laughs> power brand you just plug the power into here and provide additional power for the extra expansion adapters Dull. So another interesting thing was this uh, side pack attachment and they've just got a big 0.1 inch uh, header connector along here and you could get things like, ta-da, a parallel printer attachment. Why they didn't include a printer port on the main unit, I don't know. Anyway, they would just uh, plug into the side like that. So it's a little bit kludgy, but um, you know, uh, whatever. Anyway, this one's interesting. This is a 512K uh, memory sidecar. This might have been an aftermarket thing, mod modified by Don Bishop. Good on you, Don from Marietta. Um, in 1989. So this is way after this machine was discontinued. It was actually only lasted about a year and a bit. It was discontinued in 1985. So it, it was just a complete flop after selling uh, 200 or shipping. 270,000 units, I believe it was. But anyway, this is actually the 128K memory expansion pack, which does actually have the DMA controller built in. So if you plugged in the side memory expansion pack, you would overcome that uh, issue with the um, uh, video uh, sharing the memory inside there. So we've got a standard 128K pack, but it looks like this one's been modified. So this one was a fully loaded beast at uh, 640K. No one would ever need more than 640K. Check it out, I actually found one of the original cartridges. It was squirreled away in the bottom of the box and made in USA, version 1.00. Thank you very much. I'm a cartridge basic. And this one actually um, uh, overwrote the, well, or supplemented the internal basic or whatever um, that supported uh, more enhan enhanced modes and things like that. But yeah, it's great. But check out inside here, they've actually filled that with Sponge, oh, that would not fare well and with time because uh, that, that that spongy stuff is notorious uh, for like uh, degrading that um, cell, the, you know, the cellular foam uh, type stuff just degrades with time, but meh, not sure what they were trying to do there. Oh, check it out. It's a mask ROM. None of that EEPROM rubbish. Now on the back here, well, it did come with uh, actually quite a decent array of uh, peripheral uh, and expansion ports and whatnot. Um, people didn't like the fact that they use these non-standard 0.1 inch 
headers on here. I mean, basically the only standard things on here are the uh, composite video uh, connector and also the uh, audio over uh, audio jack over here. So let's have a look at the uh, ports it's got. It actually came with two joystick ports, which is uh, pretty good. Um, L is actually a spare, so I don't know if it was ever actually used for anything. K is for keyboard if you wanted the wired keyboard and didn't want to use that uh, crappy infrared uh, thing. LP is for the light pen, uh, T is actually for television, uh, believe it or not, if you didn't want to use the composite video, but it's also got D is for uh, direct video, which we'll take a look at in a second. S is for serial, so it didn't use a standard like D9 or D25 serial port. You had to get the adapter cable, which by the way, came in its own box. Look at that, adapter cable for serial devices. It's probably extra, no doubt. You wouldn't get that for nothing from IBM. And um, C is for the cassette uh, interface here. But if you wanted to drive your uh, monitor, I'm not sure if it actually, I'm sure if you bought the monitor it came with it, but there was the big box for the IBM color display for the adapter cable. But check it out, in true IBM fashion, over-engineered, look at this, um, AM, genuine AMP connectors, thank you very much for playing, fantastic, look at the shielding on that, what a Bobby Dazzler, they've really gone to town on that adapter cable just for the, uh, <laughs> the monitor. Awesome. And of course that wouldn't actually connect to your monitor, it just converted the bloody 0.1 inch header to your standard D9 here. <laughs> Unbelievable. For those playing long at home, made in the United States of America in Armonk, New York. Awesome. Oh, and it is of course the model number 4860 for those playing long at home and contains copyrighted code. Whoa, you're well listed. So you know what we say here on the EV blog, don't turn it on, take it apart. Let's go. Um, there doesn't seem to be any screws on this thing. Um, unless they're under the, oh, the feet, they look hard to get off, but uh, looks like there might be some clips or something. Let's give that a burl. Yeah, no worries. Oh, look at that. We're in like Flynn. Beautiful. <laughs> There's our expansion boards. Power supply is on an expansion board. Check that out. It's not too dusty. And it's a neat enough uh, arrangement in there. Now, of course, famously, it does not use the standard uh, ISA, <laughs> IBM um, expansion connectors because, you know, they didn't want to uh, eat into their uh, PC market that they were uh, dominating at the time. So, yeah, they deliberately uh, dumbed this one down. Now, it was actually... Uh, the PC Junior was actually technically uh, cloned, in quote marks, by uh, my first computer, the uh, Tandy 1000. And I've done a video on the Tandy 1000, I'll link in at the end and down below as well, where I uh, design a turbo board for the Tandy 1000. But the Tandy 1000 overcame all the issues with the IBM PC Junior, used standard ISA expansion slots. And uh, even though the uh, PC Junior was a complete and utter flop, the Tandy 1000 was actually very popular, and a lot of games at the time actually had a, uh, a Tandy 1000 graphics, supported the Tandy 1000 enhanced graphics mode, which actually came from the, uh, so some of it, I believe, came from the uh, PC Junior. So there you go, even though this was a flop, it did morph into uh, when... You know, you didn't use proprietary connectors and all sorts of other crap. Um, when you actually made it PC uh, compatible, then it could have actually been a success. And it was for Tandy. Now, thermally, our fan is actually in there. Panna flow for those laying along at home. Um, and, of course, the air intake is at the front, comes across. It's got to sort of make its way around this card. I don't, the floppy drive controller card. So when you put that in, it just kind of completely screws up uh, the airflow. But anyway, it does uh, suck it out uh, from here and blows it out the back. And they've got this little uh, guide thing which uh, attempts to sort of spread the air out across the grill here. Eh, it's not great. Well, let's have a look at the uh, power supply here. It's not too bad at all. Um, it's only a single-sided uh, card edge here. You'll notice the big, uh, large, multi-pin uh, contacts on there for the uh, current. That'd be the ground. Uh, there'd be plus, I think there's just plus 5 volt. And ground on here, and there you go. Oh, old school square layout. But you can see that it's only a single uh, card edge 
contact there. And basically we've got uh, two um, big switching regulators here, SGSL296Hs, uh, and this one's dash 5, so that would be the 5 volt, and this is dash 12, so that would be the uh, 12 volt switching converter. They've got a big ass looking inductor there potted. They'd have another one up here that looks fully, uh, fully encapsulated, fully potted, and... Uh, just the output uh, filter caps there, made in Japan, good stuff. We've got a uh, heatsink on the uh, diode bridge on the input, but it's not, this is not mains uh, voltage at all, of course. This is just, uh, I think it's uh, 16 volts AC in, um, and that's all she wrote. So there you go. That's going to be pretty reliable. Then we've got an additional uh, power cable here. It's just running across the top of the board. It's a little bit how you're doing. I believe that's going over to power. The floppy drive up there, yep, that'd power the floppy drive. And then this looks like just the uh, fan uh, controller going, well, I don't, know, I don't think it's uh, temperature controlled. I think it just uh, provides power to the fan. And we have another board here. I don't think anyone ever made a uh, PC Junior compatible, like, physical machine please correct me if i'm wrong but there you go there's our additional uh memory expansion board that's the extra um, 64k to bring it to the 128k and as you can see there's no dma controller nothing on there at all um and there's our other 60 there's our internal 64k ram down there and as i said uh one of the <laughs> reasons this thing wasn't popular is that it was particularly slow even though the 4.7 7 megahertz 8088 was, you know, pretty pretty good for the time, uh, especially, you know, compared to the uh, Commodores and the Apples and stuff. But, um, yeah, it was just, like, crippled. So, uh, in terms of uh, sharing the memory, and also, I believe, um, there's reports that uh, you couldn't even use the keyboard when the floppy drive was being accessed, or you couldn't, uh, the serial port didn't work properly when, uh, you know, it was doing something. So, yeah, it, it, they made some engineering choices in this thing to try and cut it down because they didn't want to eat into their PC market. Oh, I forgot to mention before, um, this is uh, quite novel, built-in uh, modem, but it didn't come with that. You had to actually uh, get the uh, modem card extra. Novation Inc. IBM, not IBM design, there you go, um, and uh, 8250, um, yep, it's all, oh, that's IBM custom, is it? Well, it's got the IBM part number, it could just be an off-the-shelf uh, part, but Novation, um, they've got maybe their two custom uh, gate arrays or something like that. And, of course, the uh, uh, telephone line isolation uh, transformer and whatnot. That's about all she wrote. Um, yeah, there you go. I don't know how much extra the modem costs, but, hey, that, you know, that was a good touch if you could get that built in. Especially, like, uh, because people who would buy this would be business people who just want a home computer, but they don't want to spend, you know, pony up for the full IBM PC at home, so you get the PC Junior, and hey, you might want to tie into some system or something. So a modem, that was a nice touch. And over here, it looks like we might have a, a dedicated infrared uh, board, which is on standoffs uh, off the main board. Hmm, it's a bit how you doing. And there's the uh, floppy drive controller. Doesn't really compare to the uh, was one, does it? But uh, yeah, I'm sure it's a bit more advanced. Uh, the original machine had single-sided 360K floppy in it, but uh, this one um, might have the 1.2 meg um, high-density one, so I'm not sure. But yeah, it originally came with 360K. I'll tell you what, I rather like the uh, design of how the floppy drive uh, goes in there. There's the uh, plastic clips, which are actually on uh, the bottom of the case, and you just uh, push those in, and it goes through the matching holes on the PCB, and Bob's your uncle. That's a, that's a nice bit of system design there. Now we can have a closer look at the floppy mechanism here. Love a good floppy. And uh, we can see that it's an... I won't take the plastic cover off, couldn't be bothered. Um, it's an Alps FDD 2624 BG1 for those playing along at home. Um, I don't know whether what density that one is. I love it how they have the spindle speed uh, encoder chart on there so that you can uh, get like timing uh, chart so that you can get your strobe in there and figure out the exact uh, timing because you have to calibrate these. You have to get in there and go eh, 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 with your tongue at the right angle. Um, where are the trimmer? 
Uh, they, uh, they might, trimmer pots might be on the bottom side or something for that. Anyway, I'm not sure whether or not this, uh, what density this one is, but I do know it's double sided because that's definitely a double sided head down in there. And of course, we're, oh, I can, uh, can lift that puppy up a little bit. Um, and we've definitely got the two uh, shielded cables coming out there one for the top head, one for the bottom head. So no worries, that's double sided floppy. And the belts in there, they still look in good nick. So uh, I reckon this thing would uh, still work a treat. And the case is actually um, nickel screened. Uh, so RFI for RFI uh, shielding reasons. And of course that is completely conductive. And there you have it. That's not a bad looking board at all. Looks like it's a uh, four layer job. We've got the classic uh, ground and power to all be virtually all five volts. I don't think there's another uh, rail on there. Uh, you know, there'd be maybe the odd uh, 12 volt analog or uh, something floating around. But uh, yeah, uh, ground and power planes in the middle. Uh, we've got all the traces going in this direction on the top side. And if we flip around, I'm sure we'll find they're all going in the opposite direction, vertical like that. That's your classic uh, two-sided uh, digital layout like that. So that's a very nice looking board. I like that. There's no bodges on it. There's no uh, nothing how you're doing on there whatsoever. So if we go in, we'll have a more detailed uh, look. But uh, where's Wally? Where's the processor? Jobby's down here. There it is. Let's go have a quick squiz. Ta-da! For all you fanboys. It's the 8088. There it is. That's a genuine uh, Intel jobby. Now, I do believe that um, IBM were paranoid back in the uh, PC days that um, it was a single, the Intel chip, the 8088, that they had bet their entire line of PCs on was a single source chip from Intel. So I think they pretty much uh, strong-armed um, AMD and maybe uh, one or two other companies to actually license the manufacturer of this. So um, you can actually get um, AMD branded Intel processors. <laughs> Go figure. And as for the uh, infrared board, geez, that's a big infrared uh, transceiver, well, uh, receiver. It's just a receiver. Wow, you know, compare that to a modern uh, infrared uh, transceiver. Geez, little surface mount jobby, no contest. But they've gone to the effort to uh, shield the bottom of that board. So they're really, in IBM, you know, it's IBM, um, <laughs> red tape galore. So they, you know, they, they take EMI seriously. All right, let's check out the board, shall we? I'll do this a little bit different. I'll do like a screen capture uh, talking headshot here on the PC instead of uh, talking behind the camera like I normally do. So let's uh, zoom in. By the way, I, I, as I said, I really like this board. It is uh, quite professionally designed, uh, professionally uh, laid out and manufactured. It just feels like a serious computer motherboard as you'd expect from IBM it's you know different to uh, the PCs of the day it's just much better uh, it, it just feels you know it's the warm fuzzy much higher quality sort of you know industrial computer rather than you know slapped together in Singapore that um, <laughs> all the Singapore back in the 80s was the place where all the cheap stuff was uh, made and Taiwan as well instead of um, China these days, of course, China wasn't the thing back then. Anyway, it just feels really professional. It's that. So let's take a look at it. Of course, we've got our uh, 8088 Intel here, as we uh, mentioned, and our requisite, um, you know, jelly bean glue logic all around here. This is all 74 LS uh, stuff, low power shocky, um, a pretty standard uh, for the time. You know, uh, nobody was using HC. Did was HC around? Back then, um, I, everyone was still using LS. It was still the thing. So uh, anyway, um, supporting that is the Intel um, 8259. This is the interrupt uh, controller. And here's the data sheet for that. Um, a classic, and of course, 8086, 8088 compatible, but it comes from the Intel 8085 series, the 8-bit architectures. And that was, of course, the advantage of the Intel 8088 is that it effectively had an, well, it had an 8-bit bus. It was a 16-bit processor internally, but it all the, all the peripherals in the bus was accessed in 8 bits. So um, you could actually use well, Intel could reuse, this was a big part of the success of the original IBM PC, is they could reuse all their existing 8-bit peripheral chips 
which uh, they had and they were making for everyone else. Um, so, you know, it, it just made sense to um, use these. So, yeah, um, that's your standard uh, PIA, your programmable interrupt controller. And above that, we've got ourselves uh, the Intel slash AMD, manufactured by AMD. As I said, the um, AMD second source. They had a license to actually manufacture the IBM chips back in the day, and that was a thing, because IBM, you know, they want their second and third source for all these parts. They don't like themselves, unless it's them making it, they don't like themselves uh, tying them into one manufacturer. And of course, IBM, Big Blue, you know, they <laughs> carried a lot of clout back in the day. So um, uh, Intel were very happy to give them license. Anyway, the 8253, let's go to the data sheet. Classic programmable interval uh, timer. So it'd it'd have all your timer modes and things like that, which you'd use for uh, maybe uh, joystick control and uh, things like that to time how far you know time different uh, things and stuff like that. Very important back in the day. Of course, all these uh, separate peripheral chips are all like integrated all into the <laughs> the uh, chipset chips these days which is so familiar with on the motherboard but back in the day they didn't have these dedicated chipsets which put them all into one they had these dedicated chips which you have to use so that's the PIA once again um, 8085 uh, compatible MCS 85 compatible by the way if you're actually uh, interested in that MCS 85 the MCS 85 was actually an Intel uh, system design kit for the 8085 processor that they had back in the day and this would allow you to actually you know figure out how all the chips work you individually program the addresses and you know um experiment with these uh chips until the cows come home so that's why why they would have that was the original uh system design kit so that's why that they would actually have this uh mca id 85 compatible that's where it comes from and next to that we've got the intel uh, p8255 the uh classic programmable peripheral interface so let's go to the data sheet and take a look at that here we go um and it had uh, programmable io pins allowed them to interface with any other miscellaneous io that they wanted to uh hook up to on the machine so that was you'd find that in practically every uh you know computer it, it be it ibm or whatever um it was the other uh processors of the time would have their equivalent to the programmable peripheral interface so that would just allow you to uh do read write uh control to various ports and nothing special it was just um a way to access uh stuff on the cpu to access regular IO pins on the bus. So uh, equivalent to a microcontroller these days where, you know, except it has all these built in. You have IO pins built into your microcontrollers these days. Microprocessors back in the old days, they didn't. You had a, a data and address bus, which you had to hook up to these um, IO controller chips, essentially. Okay, let's pan around up to the corner up here. What do we got? Haha, ha, winner winner chicken dinner. It's the classic um triple five timer, or in this case the five five eight, the quad triple five timer. The five five six was the dual, five five eight was the quad, and that would be no doubt being used for the joystick port. That was an absolute classic. So how that would work is that the uh adjustable pots, the adjustable uh potentiometers, adjustable resistance on the joystick pots would actually uh feed into the triple five timer and actually control its uh pulse width so then you could um uh, or, or frequency it's um and then they'd use the timer counter chip to actually uh figure out how long that pulse was and you could figure out the position of the joystick and that's how they did it it was very common it was used in every pc back in the day i'm not just talking about ibm pc but a whole slew of other personal computers as well and let's have a look in the top corner here, because here's an old friend. Uh, you might be able to guess what this one does with the proximity to the crystal. Yes, it's the uh, clock generator chip used to generate the processor clock. But not only that, it's also used to generate the uh, video clock as well. In this case, it's going to be a 14.31818 megahertz, I believe that's correct, megahertz crystal, which is actually divided by three. So if you go 14.318, 1.8 divided by 3 to give you your 
4.77 megahertz um, uh, IBM PC, the classic IBM PC clock. But if you divide it by four, then it also happens to give you the uh, 3.58 megahertz uh, video clock as well. So that's a, effectively, I think, why they chose 4.77 is so that they could use the same clock. I think uh, the 8088, was it rated to 5 megahertz or something? So they could have pushed it a bit higher, but then they would have needed a second crystal, second chip, all that sort of stuff to generate the two different uh, clocks required. So they actually shared the crystal. So I think that's where the history of the 4.77 megahertz clock actually comes from. Because if you, I think if you read the data sheet, well, let's go have a look, shall we? And ta-da, yes, there it is. 5 megahertz for the 8088, or 8 megahertz for the 8088 too. So they could have actually pushed it to 5 megahertz in the original IBM PC, but hey, they <laughs> were cutting cost on this thing. Cost was, you know, reasonably important. They're trying to get it down, and it's nice engineering. You just share the two. 4.77, eh, near enough to 5. No worries. So let's just pan around a bit more, shall we? Nothing doing, nothing doing. Um, they're all just the interface um, up the top. Let's actually go down a bit more down here. More uh, 74LS 373s. Nothing doing there. Nothing interesting. What's that crusty burger there? I'm um, sorry, I didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't... Like I wiped off a few of these chips. Anyway, here is the ROM. And this is interesting. Look, it's not socketed. It's soldered directly onto the board. So not only is it a mask ROM, none of this EEPROM rubbish, um, it's <laughs> directly on the board. Date code 8th week 84 there. So that was actually before uh, it was officially in introduced in March 84. So there you go. They were pretty sure about their... Uh, uh, bias code. <laughs> so good luck upgrading your bias on that puppy. You got to desolder the chip from a full layer board. Oopsie. Um, and then we've got a TMM uh, twenty three two five six, um, which is ta da a. Um, once again, another uh, mask ROM. Um, it's a 256k bit, 32k by eight, and that probably contains the uh, the basic and the DOS, because um, I think it had DOS in ROM, didn't it? 2.01 or something like that? Awesome. That's where it would be. Um, it's not in the same chip as the BIOS, I don't think. And then um, here's the expansion connectors, uh, the cartridge connectors down the bottom. Um, so yeah, the, they look to be tying straight in. So I'm not sure where, like, and if they had any hot plug, because as you saw, um, you, you believe you could hot plug these things in and automatically detect and reboot and everything else. And um, I'm not since seeing any really major protection um, stuff for hot plugging and things like that. So eh, maybe that was a bit, how you doing? back in the day, but I believe that was um, the thing to do. Anyway, let's go on over here and have a look at the RAM. Now, this is the 64K RAM. It's a remarkably uh, few chips because it used uh, 64K, uh, the, um, uh, 4, 1, the classic 4164, of course, which is the uh, 8, 64K by one bit, and they've got eight of them, uh, which gives a total of 64K bytes. And you'll notice that there's only eight, there's not nine, so there's no parity on there. So if we have a look at that, um, it was available in SIP and DIP. This is this happens to be the uh, SIP package one. It was common back in the day to see uh, SIP packages uh, like this, but they had the room on here. They didn't have to use the SIP. I don't know, maybe the DIP was cheaper. Who knows? And I'm not sure what this uh, Motorola part here is, the 15.03723. It's, you know, copyright IBM. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to put any more effort into uh, searching for that one. Um, maybe, I, I don't know. Did it maybe handle the um, infrared stuff? Infrared uh, comms for the keyboard? Um, perhaps? Not entirely sure. Um, Let's go up here. This is an interesting one. What on earth is this? Um, 15.03730. More IBM part numbers. Now, if we actually have a look at the technical reference manual here, yes, I'll provide a link in down below. It's got everything in here. So, yeah, great bedtime reading. Uh, if we have a look at the block diagram here, then it's got... Uh, Look, it's got uh, some weight state logic down here. It's got a um, MMI logic and stuff like that. So maybe that's what those uh, custom gate array 
chips there are actually uh, doing. You know, they might have a couple of custom uh, parts to do that, perhaps. Okay, let's go and find the uh, 76496 sound chippy, shall we? 76496. Ah, where is it? Where is it? Where's our sound? There's our audio up there. Ah, there it is. 76496. There's our um, sound. It's not much, is it? What is it? Three voice. It's a simple three voice thing or uh, something like that. Nothing special. And of course, all your video was handled by your classic MC6845 here. And this was used in, I don't know, half the computers in the, 19, the late 70s, um, the early 80s. Um, kind of thing. It was just everywhere. And it's just your uh, regular CRT uh, controller. And of course, it could do 80 by 24, uh, you know, text and stuff like that. And it was 6800 compatible. So I'm not sure when it first came out, but it it is, you know, it's it's pretty ancient. Um, and yeah, it was, I don't know, what can you say? It's a 6845. And of course, you've got to have your serial port uh, controller. So that one here, it is, is classic 8250 serial controller, which is now, all these things are now embedded inside the modern chipsets. They're still embedded in there um, to you know get all the um, serial ports and whatnot on your standard PCs these days. You're integrated in your Northbridge or your Southbridge, where the bloody chipset it is. I don't know. And um, it's, it's classic. It's the National Semiconductor Jobby. Um, it, was it the National Semiconductor? It was an actually, yes, a genuine national semiconductor. Beauty. Um, and yeah, it's it's the serial UART. Um, and that's it. Too bad they used a dodgy bloody connector on it. You know, like the, the like <laughs> they couldn't put a standard D9 or a D25 on there. Unbelievable. And I do believe that's pretty much um, all she wrote. That looks in That looks like it's like a black hole. That's like, I can't. <laughs> bonus you pay more to get a black hole in your pcb so that's what you need for the ibm pc junior and as i said it's quite a well laid out board look all the chips are in the same direction all the traces are all going in one direction all the other ones are going in vertical on the other side it's a beautiful layout i like it um and it's you know just uses all off the shelf in well no as we as we looked at there might be a couple of custom gate arrays in there which might have definitely got the uh parts count down but there's lots of jelly bean interface logic lots of it's all pretty sure it's all 74 ls sometimes they'll use like a 74 f somewhere if they're having like you know really fast like propagation delay problems or something like that you might see one or two of those sneak in but in this one i think it's all pretty much ls yeah anyway there you go i hope you liked that uh kind of detailed look at the main board in the pc junior it's neato so there you have it. I think I'll uh, leave it at that. Obviously, I've got to look into maybe RTFM, uh, read the manual about the error and things like that, get into it. But you can see that the hardware still works. The classic IBM PC Junior, one of the biggest uh, spectacular fails in uh, the personal computer history. And <laughs> really, it, it was just a complete and utter flop. But as I said, like the uh, the Tandy 1000 sort of uh, derived uh, from this and was a success. And I got my um, start on a uh, Tandy 1000, which I'll link in the video about here, right at the end of this. Check it out. So anyway, if you enjoyed that, please give it a big thumbs up because that always helps a lot with the engagement and all that sort of stuff on YouTube. And hopefully they won't demonetize this one. But Ah, oh, geez, I've got a now running list of videos demonetized now. It's hilarious. Anyway, <laughs> um, and as always, discuss down below on the EV blog forum or in the comments. I usually, uh, uh, when I make a video live, I usually like in like the first hour is sort of like the best time to get me uh, for comments on videos and stuff like that. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Catch you next time. Hello.